behind mm -hmm. the window. He has been raining in Paris. Uh, he has been raining in Paris for the last three days, so uh, it's been difficult for me to see the sun. So, uh, but uh, it's good for you. Um, so, thank you again. C can you see my slides? We can see your slides. Um, it's a little bit easier for us to hear us when you put your microphone a little bit closer to your mouth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. So thank you. A, a, a quick, quick, quick presentation, maybe two minutes about my firm, Day One, which is a firm that I created almost 15 years ago after working for um, Arthur Anderson. Uh, so basically, it's a niche firm. We're only working as a management consulting firm. We're working for corporate departments, mainly legal and compliance. So we also work for audit and tax, but mainly legal department and compliance. And that's a, a huge topic for for this uh, conversation today. Uh, digitization of legal department and compliance is huge. It's very huge, uh, very important. And the second segment for us is professional service firms. So we're also working for many professional services firms, but mainly for law firms. The majority of our clients are law firms in this segment. Uh, so 85% of our turnover is around legal department, compliance department, and law firm, just, just, just to, for you to know. We are a very niche and small firm, only um, 10, 10 people, based in Paris, based in Morocco, Casablanca, and we also have an office in, um, in New York. Uh, but we travel a lot to uh, many, many places. We're very uh, fortunate to, to see many culture, many companies, many firms. Um, <coughs> Because you know, when you're in a niche and you're very um, fortunate, uh, we are able to, to 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 go around the globe and, and work for many countries. Um, these are some names because we love our clients. So, uh, Olivier, so did you want to share your? Did you are you showing your slides too, or did you want to share your slides? We yeah. don't see them at the moment. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so you just have to quickly hit the share. Is it working now? Let's it should be working. Yeah, yep. yes. it's there you are. Now we okay. see it. So this is what, what I was saying about our uh, corporate departments, clients and professional service firms. This is what I was saying about uh, the different places where we have uh, uh, offices and where we, when we have clients all around the globe. And just, there were some names about the law firm we're working for, uh, either in, in Europe or even in the States or in other countries like in Africa. Um, uh, and these are the name of the uh, large organization and we're working for different organizations in different industry and mainly as I was saying about uh, legal departments and compliance uh, departments. Um, we have a fast changing environment and what we're saying about, uh, about this uh, uh, digital uh, transformation is, about, is, is that it's all about um, what we call the VTC revolution and VTC is about three things basically uh, the value um, it's, it's really about the value the value you bring to the organization whether you're a lawyer outside counsel or whether you are in-house counsel uh, the technology of course tools and uh, the artificial intelligence and big data I'm going to talk about it and you know collaboration among lawyers and with the business and with the outside counsel whenever you are a legal department for instance so the legal tech landscape this is the report we've been doing. Uh, we've been working eight months doing data collection to, uh, between December 2015 uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, in, oops, I'm sorry, in early 16. Uh, we've been looking at 140 startups in 12 countries, um, looking at their mission statement, their, um, their target, very important. I'm going to talk about it in a, in a couple of seconds about the offering, about the level of automation. So for us, our level of automation from one to four is first, when you, when you have one, it's basically we have a tool, but the human being is doing all the work. When we have two, it was a human being plus some technology algorithm or something else that is helping the human. Number three is really a service where you have technology and no real human intervention. And number four is about real artificial intelligence, hard artificial intelligence, um, uh, machine learning, natural language processing, um, and etc. So we've been looking at those 140 startups. And I'm sorry, not everything is not every data is on 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 our reports. We have to keep those data, some data. Um, but we've been looking at those legal techs, 
so that uh, we try to know exactly what they do because it's quite interesting. Uh, again, it's not a it's it, it, it's not a, a, a study about every single legal tech in the world. It's just a selection at that time. Again, at that time because it's it's moving very fast. About 140 in in uh, eight countries. Um, the thing that is very important is that it started with B2C in terms of uh, in terms of targeting, and now it's moving very fast on B2B. Um, and the clients that we have, uh, uh, being law firm and, and legal and compliance departments, they're now moving to to use legal tech uh, startups. Um, and and what is interesting is that sometimes you have startups. I'm going to talk about it that really target individuals or small companies. And I went to that, cannot, I can't give the name, but I, I went to that huge organization, huge company, international company, and I said to the GC, well, look at their technology, not look at what they do, meaning that creating you know, contracts automatically for individuals or, or small company, but look at the technology. If we, if we put in their database, your clauses in your contract, we, we will be able to work in your legal department, again, very large and international legal departments, and to create automatically uh, contracts and so that the business can ask questions and then can create, sure, for now, low value contract, I agree. Uh, but again, it's the, the, what is very important that we are gaining time and for my clients to be able to gain time is, is, very, is very important. So, the, the, the move, I don't know if you notice that, but the move towards B2C, when we're talking about the targeting of those legal techs is very important. Um, we, we decided to create, as we know we are consultants, we decided to create a matrix, but we did not create a matrix up front before the study. We create, and, and to be frank, we, we, we've been working on four different matrix. Uh, we created those, this particular matrix at the end of the study so that it will try hopefully to gather exactly what those startups are doing. So basically in this, uh, in this slide, what we're saying that when you look at those digital um, organization and tools, they, they do three things. They can, they can help you share, share data and information. They can help you deliver something, a contract or analysis, and they can help you make a decision. That's the three things that those uh, legal tech organization we studied uh, help you and help lawyers to do. And then when you have the three stuff, uh, you also see that they are enhancing the work of lawyers or replacing, and I'm not saying that they're replacing a lawyer, they're replacing lawyer in some tasks. And the segmentation of tasks is very important. They're not replacing to so far, so far, they're not replacing, because I don't know what's happening in five years or 10 years from now, but they're not replacing uh, a lawyer, they're replacing a lawyer performing some tasks. So that's very important because we need to do some task segmentation to see who's doing what. And it's very important in the organization, whether it's a law firm or whether it's a legal um, department. So just looking at those firms and looking at what they do in terms of contracting, advising, mitigation, management, or administrative work, we, we, we saw that they were doing, you know, that kind of thing that you can see hopefully in the metrics that we, what, that, that we did a lot. Uh, what we see, what we saw then, and what we are seeing currently right now with, with the technology uh, at, at almost the end of uh, the year 2017 is that um, startups are moving to the delivering, what we call the delivering segment and the decision making segment, which is something that is very, very important. Uh, because this is exactly what lawyers are looking for. Again, for me, the objectives, and I was talking to 50 GCs in Europe this morning, um, they were saying that the thing that is the most important for us is that we are able not to waste time, to gain time. So if, if you can, they were saying to me, if you can help us at least gain two hours, two hours per week per lawyer, you will be God because this is what we need. This is a lot of value. We need hours to spend, not in our home, but to spend on value and high value work. Please help us to just gain two hours per week per lawyer. When you're talking to organization where they have 50 lawyers, 
hundred lawyers or with the banks where they have more than 1,000 lawyers, it's, it's, it's a lot of value for the organization. So if we look at very quickly, um, uh, and, and please don't stop me if I'm too long, if we look at the thing that uh, we, we have on the report and the thing that we see in the market, uh, the sharing and replace is, of course, Russ is, Russ is king. Uh, Doctrine.fr is a French legal tech that is also uh, trying to do some stuff regarding the legal watch and trying to automatically bring you the, uh, uh, the analysis of thousands of data in the market in French, which is uh, quite interesting because the other problem is that we have lots of organization and lots of legal tech that are dealing with uh, uh, English language, but not French or Spanish or, or other language, which is also very important. Um, so, so we, 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 we looked at the different um, uh, startups from, of, of course, Europe, of course, the States and, and, and UK, but Israel and, and, and other countries. Uh, when we look at the deliver, delivering and plus enhance, uh, we see, you know, organization, uh, legal tech, I'm sorry, to help you to create a monthly contract, to do disintermediation, what we call push away, meaning that it's not something that you do as a lawyer, but that you push away uh, so that your client is doing it for you. Uh, like, you know, Uber is asking you to put some data on your app, but now you need to, you can ask lawyer, uh, you can ask your client to, to put some data in your app or, or in your legal tech to do some uh, uh, search engine so that they can accelerate uh, again uh, the search um, because it's very important to help you to work on the online dispute resolution platform uh, and do some e-signature stuff. Um, delivering and replace is also interesting in terms of uh, a blockchain smart contract, but uh, in terms of uh, having you know, a questionnaire in, in what we call the natural language, uh, being the, the business language, where they can ask questions and they get an automatically contract or they can, they can even get advice automatically on so far low value work, but still, because I'm working on B2B, I'm only working with large law firm, a large organization, large legal department. Um, it, it's really important. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, trying to uh, go to, uh, um, to ask for a, a ticket or a fine to negotiate that. It's, it's, that's not my business. So I noticed there are lots of legal tech in this, um, in this area, but now the, the legal techs are moving to the B2B uh, again segment, which is very, very important. Uh, decision making in due diligence and statistics, um, which is a big problem, I may say, I have to say to, to you guys who are experts in Stanford, uh, lawyers don't understand anything about statistics. So that's something that I think is very interesting for uh, lawyers now to, to learn and to know how to use statistics, not to not to take the statistics for granted, be able to you know, work with variables and, and hypotheses and to look for something else. That, that's a topic that I think is very important, at least for our clients. Um, in, in also decision making now and replace, automated audit. Uh, we find lots of uh, you know, um, legal tech that can take thousands of contracts. And if you want to check that the, the uh, A close or the whatever, you know, the, the clause you're looking for um, is, is, is in every single contract. And, and, I, and I saw the stuff. Uh, it's not only, you know, it's not a PowerPoint presentation. I, I saw the tools. You can upload thousands of contracts in, in less than a second. The, the answer will be, this is a contract where the, for instance, the ethic clause is not there. Well, that's number one. Number two is that you ask your 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 bot to look at thousands of and, and again thousands and thousands. I'm currently working with a firm where with a with a company where they're doing fourteen thousand contracts a year. I call them the uh, McDonald's of contract. Uh, they're doing so many contracts, but with less than one second, they can analyze whether you have the ethic clause or whether the ethic clause and other clause, of course, just an example is different from the standard clause that you that you decided to have on every single contract. So then with the machine learning, you can say, you can look at both clauses and say, I agree, even if it's different, boom, this is okay. And then the machine will learn that even that even though the, the clause is different, it's okay. Or yes, the clause is different, 
I do not agree and I have to change that. And then, you know, as machine learning, they will learn that they need to alert you every time they see that clue that is not relevant for your organization. So it's something that is very, very interesting for, for lawyers to, to, to save time. I know it's very fast and I'm sorry, but uh, if, if you have questions, I'll try to answer those questions. So what we have now in those areas is, is something you know a lot is, is uh, for us things like, you know, what 2.0 platform, decision tree, chatbots. I'm currently working with a huge organization. It's very uh, frustrating because I, I, I can't say the name and we are developing legal chatbot for them because uh, lawyers, in-house lawyers, they have so many questions. Some are not even legal questions, some are stupid questions from the business that they're wasting so much time on, 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 on you know, just uh, answering the phone or answering the emails that they decided when, when we work with them, they decided that the most important thing is develop a, a chatbot that can answer the stupid question that they have from the business. Uh, the, for us, the, 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 week, the work in progress is, is where, where we see lots of uh, um, opportunity um, is, is the, uh, of course, the deep learning, the reinforcement learning, and et cetera. But I see lots of um, opportunity in the, what I call, and I don't know if it's clear for you, but what I call the semantic artificial intelligence technology where we could have bots that can read uh, language and, and understand this language and, and do some summary or some analysis. Um, I'm very uh, uh, happy because I'm a former philosopher of language. This is what I study at the Sorbonne University when I was young. And my parents told me I was going to be unemployed for the rest of my life. But uh, suddenly I find out that uh, being a, a philosopher of language is, is, is now you know, up to date. And, and working on semantic is, is very important. Um, it's very, very important. And, and you're going to find some research from uh, uh, either from Bakhtin or from uh, uh, other um, uh, philosopher of language uh, like Austin that is very interesting. We saw some, uh, just to give you an example, we saw some uh, um, legal tech that, is, that, that has been working three years with 10 data scientists. You know, the investment fund, they have... Um, the investment uh, prospectus uh, brochure, it's sometimes between 50 pages to 150 pages. They develop that algorithm and that uh, artificial intelligence tool where three years, where now the, the, the bot is able to read these 50, 100, 150 pages. And, and I saw that again and click in less than a second, you have the strategy of that fund. So they, 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 they taught the bot to understand, to read everything and to get the main information so that in less than a second and commercial bank, they have, you know, they have dozens of people reading uh, the, that kind of document every year, every day. In less than a second, they're looking at, okay, this fund is investing in this industry. This fund is investing only from 5 million to 15 million dollars or euros. This fund is, investing in that kind of stuff. This one is looking for this and this and this. So in less than a second, you suddenly have the, the most important strategy of that fund. It's quite interesting. And, and it's really amazing to, to, to see this. Um, some example, I want to give you some example that is uh, real, is, is uh, about uh, contract management. Uh, of course, you know, click to accept, you know, automatization of power of attorney, you know, a signature. Um, one example that is quite interesting is the mix between human and digital capacity and interaction. There is one biotech, it's, it's a human, it's a, it's a US firm, I'm sorry, in uh, biotechnology where they designed a, a, a contract management tool um, so there is no paper anymore and uh, they, they did so many templates uh, for low value work that uh, they also using a pool of paralegal in and, and, and it's funny, it's based in California and in the UK, working all around the globe so that some people, paralegal, are working on templates with the tool and the lawyers, and I met them, they're not allowed to do contract. They're not allowed to do contract unless it's a strategic contract or it's a high risk contract. That's amazing. So if, if the guy is doing a contract, 
there's a big problem for him. So it's a mix of human, you know, human and digital stuff. Um, uh, in artificial, what I call artificial assistant client interface, it's, um, uh, we also saw that there was a German uh, legal tech working with the IT, in, in an IT company where, you know, the business people, they, that's exactly what they want to do. I want to do business uh, in, in this country, with this provider, and et cetera. And suddenly with, you know, the decision tree, all the information and procedure and policies, they get, they get information from, from the bot saying that uh, you, you cannot do it or you can do it or you have to call this person, et cetera. In terms of transparency, in terms of being able to trace who's doing what is very important. Um, this, is, this is really key. Um, Olivier, I, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but um, do you have about seven more minutes and uh, I was I just uh, was hoping that you could leave a little bit of time for people to ask questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but, I'm but thinking, please uh, go ahead. Just, just two slides. Um, yeah. I saw that there were 576 patents for artificial intelligence for legal this year uh, and, and, and just 99 uh, patents five years ago. So that's also amazing. Um, this is something that we, we do, you know, how legal decision is about, about a contract will be done tomorrow. Uh, so this person will ask for a supplier. Uh, it will go to a bot, whether it's uh, okay. It will use, I'm sure you know, the, uh, this uh, little stuff, the uh, IFTTT, and look at different uh, organizations, whether, uh, whether you comply, you don't comply. Uh, you get a no-go or it's easy. Then you get templates. Or you have to talk to a lawyer that is doing some statistical analysis, multi-sources, then it's easy. You go back to your template or you get a bespoke contract and then an e-signature. Well, this was very funny because we thought it was for tomorrow. But we are, so that's a lie. It's today. We are currently working with legal department on this exact same workflow with different um, uh, digital tools. Well, that's amazing because if you were showing that size like, like a year, a year and a half ago, people would have said that you're crazy, but now it's real. So it's not tomorrow, it's today. Uh, the last thing is, that's my last slide, is about tomorrow's lawyer competencies. Of course, legal is key. A few things that is quite interesting, but that are privacy and big compliance. Business is key. Behavior is key, project management, interpersonal communication. And the last, and that's my last word, is very important, is that lawyers will have to learn about statistics, how to use statistics. You know, correlation is not causality, and they have to understand that. They can have to understand algorithm because they will see the input, they will see the output they need. And for me, it's a, it's a key issue to understand what the algorithm is doing to your data so that you make the right decision when you see the output. Uh, so that they will need to develop those competencies. Um, otherwise, uh, they're gonna make bad decision. This is the only thing I get for you today. All right. Question was for... quick, was quick, was quick, I'm sorry. Yeah. No worries. Uh, so, any questions for Olivier? Anyone here in the room or online, if you want us to hear you, you have to unmute yourself. You can also uh, chat your question if you like. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Oliver, for your presentation. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, I, just, I just maybe have one question. Uh, in regards to you know, to the technology which you are talking about, uh, does it take into consideration the uh, ethical duties of, of, of a lawyer? I'm, I'm imagining like if I were to consult a law firm and I get legal advice from an algorithm, what are the responsibilities of a lawyer in, in, the, in, in that particular regard? Will I be able, for example, to uh, still sue a lawyer for negligence uh, in particular to my case, if it is an al algorithm actually uh, owned by a particular law firm which responded to me, are, are there no ethical issues which, which arise in regards to the kind of technology which you're talking about? I think that's my short question. 
Yeah, thank you very much. It's a very good question. It's, it's, it's a hot topic now for uh, legal tech startups. It's also a hot topic for uh, law firm because, as you know, law firm are now partnering with those legal tech uh, startups. And, and it's, it's, it's a big issue because they need to uh, see and understand if there are any ethical uh, situation or, or um, a problem that they need to solve because whose fault is it if, if you follow the algorithm? Um, and, and again, that's why what I'm saying is that uh, we need to understand what's going on with the algorithm so that we take the, the, uh, the, the right decision. It's not because you know, the algorithm is saying that you have 80% chance of losing that case that you have to follow this algorithm and these results. You need, I, I think, we need to use our brain so that we know whether we could add some hypothesis or add variables so that uh, we're not lo losing that case uh, at, uh, and we are winning that case, even though the machine is saying that we have 80% of losing that case. Um, I think it's, it's very important. Uh, otherwise, if we, if, if, if we do exactly what the machine says, if the performing stuff, then the machine is right because we do the, what the machine says. So in terms of ethic, in terms of uh, being able to bring value to either your law firm or to your organization, uh, it's very important that we are able, to, as lawyers, to challenge what the uh, what the statistics or what the uh, what the output uh, of of uh, of uh, digital tool is saying. So yes, it's ethic is a huge topic. It's going to be a, a huge topic in the coming years. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Olivier, I have a question too. So as a um, a consultant to law firms and uh, legal departments. What sort of the, the first piece of advice you're giving them when they're thinking about uh, in, you're bringing technology to the firm or being f ready for the, this kind of new world and the future of legal services? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm telling them the first uh, technology is not the solution. So I'm saying mm -hmm. that you need to think about the VTC revolution. You need to think about the value you want to bring to the company Yes, the technology, and, and, and then how you, do, you want to do your work uh, in a collaborative way. Uh, you can't do it all. No matter, you know, if, if your company is growing, or if, if your company is in trouble, the number of work that lawyers have to do is increasing. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to handle those problems. So it's not only technologies about, you know, the, and I'm doing lots of vision and mission statement now with legal departments. This is what we want to do. This is what we don't want to do anymore. This is what we stop and they're stopping things. I was talking to that legal department. They were looking for a tool to do some low value work. And I just said <coughs> to the GC, well, you know, why don't you stop doing that? It's not relevant. It doesn't bring value. It's not, you know, you're not mitigating risks because it's not risky, just stop doing that. So it's really looking at value technology and, and collaborative. I, I really believe in those three letters, the VTC, mm -hmm. what we call the VTC revolution. Cool. Great. Well, thank you so much, Olivier. It's been really great to have you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you, you sharing your uh, insights from your report. And uh, is, there, is it accessible uh, online? Yeah. It's, uh, you can download in either in French or in English on, on our website. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and if you have any critique or comment, you can uh, you know, mm -hmm. send us some emails and we try to, to, to do more, more, more work and uh, improve Great. ourselves. We're can gonna you... try to update this uh, research because now it's beginning uh, to be old. Uh, uh -huh. We released that like uh, six months ago. Uh, so mm -hmm. six months is very old, uh, and we are seeing. That's why I tried to give you some example about what's going on with our clients. Uh, we're going to try to update it. it the, this this industry, this uh, this uh, market is going very very fast. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, could you maybe uh, text or uh, put your your contact information in the in the chat, so that people who want to reach out to you directly, they can they can reach you. That'd be great. Well, thank you so much again, Olivier. It's been great to have you. And, uh, thank you very much. And let's, thank let's, you. Let's turn it over to, to um, Thompson now. Thompson, you may have to turn on. Oh, there you are. Great.
Go ahead. Uh, and you may want to share your, your slides. Uh, okay, thank you very much, everyone who is in attendance. And I want to thank uh, Stanford Law School, uh, the uh, Cortex Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, for, for this meeting today. So, my presentation today uh, is titled uh, The Plight of the Innocent Can Autonomous Weapons Save or Protect Life Better Than Humans? Uh, and I'm going to look at this topic uh, both in the context of uh, armed conflict and also in the context of uh, law enforcement. So just uh, maybe before I start my presentation, in addition to the uh, brief background, which has already been uh, given by the chair of this meeting today, uh, my background actually, or my research, so to say, in my PhD thesis actually focused on the issue of lethal autonomous weapon system and the challenges that are posed to international law. And I was uh, seeking to find a legal solution to some of the challenges that are posed. But in my research actually on the topic, I realized that uh, this is one of the classic cases where individuals actually say that, you know, the law is not a panacea, it cannot be a solution to everything. You actually find that many other disciplines, so to say, are relevant when you are discussing this topic. So the issue of lethal autonomous weapon systems, especially at the international plane, in particular within the United Nations fora, is one of actually uh, the cutting edge issues which everyone is trying to say, what is the way forward? What are the solutions which can be found to some of the challenges which are posed? So I got first introduced to the issue of lethal autonomous weapon systems or issues of autonomy, so to say when I was working for the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions, Professor Christopher Haynes, where my main major contribution actually was uh, researching and drafting the 2013 report to the Human Rights Council and the, uh, the UN General Assembly on lethal autonomous weapon system. It was actually after the introduction of that report by Professor Christoph Haynes that the discussion uh, on lethal autonomous weapon systems started within the United Nations fora, so to say. Uh, later, I had to join actually the International Committee for Robots Arms Control, ICRAC, uh, another non governmental organization which is concerned with the challenges that are posed with these kinds of weapons to humanity in general. And uh, Early 2017, I was actually appointed to join the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Weapon Systems. This panel, in particular, is trying to find uh, scientific uh, conclusions or, or recommendations, so to say, to give to the uh, group of governmental experts that was formed by the uh, by, by United Nations States in December 2016 to look uh, at the possible future regulation of autonomous weapon systems, so to say. And what is interesting actually by uh, this group called the Group of Governmental Experts is that whatever they are going to propose uh, in as far as future regulation of autonomous weapons is concerned, is going to have repercussions or an impact actually on other uh, civilian use of, 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 of this kind of technology, so to say. So coming to my uh, presentation for today, uh, just a moment. It seems my 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 slides are not okay. My, the first question, which I actually usually st uh, start by asking when I'm making this discussion, is to what extent actually do we uh, trust machines? And I usually use this uh, photo to say uh, myself, probably with others. Uh, there are those who, when we withdraw money, even from a simple machine like an ATM machine, we, we count the money. And some people have been asking, what, what, what causes actually this trend? Uh, is it an individual <laughs> thinking the machine can actually short exchange you? Uh, and someone said, maybe those are just uh, general trust issues which probably people might have when it comes to machines. So the question which will be underlining to my presentation today is uh, to what extent 
can we trust machines to take some of these important decisions in our day-to-day -day life? So the outline of my presentation, after I just discussed briefly uh, the definition of autonomous weapon systems, I'll just give a background to what I'm calling the plight of uh, civilians in uh, armed conflict. Then uh, generally, uh, also as a, as, a, as, a, as a background, also I'll try to discuss uh, autonomy or robots, so to say, in other fields where they are playing a very important role. Then I will come to one of the major issues which I want to focus on, which is the right to life and robotic warfare and also in law enforcement, and where I'll be asking the question, can autonomous weapon system do better than humans and save life? And the, this is where I'll be looking at the legal, technical, and ethical, uh, and ethical challenges, so to say, which will be followed by conclusions and, uh, and questions. Now, in general, the definition of, uh, of lethal autonomous weapon systems as given in the, in, the, in the other slide is to say autonomous weapon systems, these are machines which, uh, once activated, are able to make the decision to kill a human being without any further human assistance. So in other words, once or human intervention, so to say, once the uh, robot is activated, it's able now to make all the legal judgments uh, as to whether the person who is being targeted is uh, a legitimate target, it's a lawful target, and whether, the, for example, proportionality requirements are met, uh, uh, whether it's in, under international humanitarian law or under uh, the law enforcement rules, so to say, and it proceeds to target and kill that individual without any further human assistance. Other scholars or other commentators actually on this topic have come to say that uh, autonomous weapon system is uh, actually a step forward uh, from drones. I think many of you may uh, might have, like especially in the United States, the discussion on drones, those remotely controlled weapons, where you say that with the drones, you have someone actually obeyed from a distance, being able to control uh, and making the decision as to who to kill. In the case of autonomous weapon system, once it, uh, it is activated, that individual is no longer in the, in, the, in the place. Now, when I say the plight of civilians, the slide I'm looking at right now, what is necessitated the desire to develop uh, this uh, autonomous weapon system? In addition to you know, other reasons which people cite is to say it is uh, the more efficient, they, they don't suffer from human weaknesses such as getting tired. They don't suffer from human weaknesses such as emotions, getting angry, and also the fact that you can save your own soldiers. Their arguments, in particular, which uh, roboticist Ron, Ron Akin has been making to say that, you know, this is a response to the plight of civilians in, the armed conf in, uh, in many armed conflicts. It's common cause across the globe, be it Syria, be it any other place in Africa, be it any other uh, uh, place in, in, in Middle East, that whenever human soldiers are involved, sometimes civilians, those who are not directly participating in hostilities, are victims. They're the ones who suffer the most. You have actually uh, innocent uh, children dying. You have women getting raped. And all these are you know, some of the problems which come with human soldiers or those who are participating in hostilities. So when some are saying the plight of civilians in the context of armed conflict is to say, maybe if we develop a robot, you know, which doesn't suffer those human weaknesses, maybe we may avoid, uh, you know, some of the challenges with the civilians or those who are perceived to be innocent are suffering. This such a thing will be welcome because we are saying that this is an ability to save life. The same thing could actually be also said in the context of law enforcement. I think it's common cause, especially of late, for example, in the United States, that there are many uh, people who have been victimized, for example, to what others refer as police brutality. If you look at some of the photos which you see there, there are uh, certain circumstances where people have said that civilians have been killed by law enforcement officials, you know, in circumstances which someone would think probably this was out of prejudice, which other, other person might be suffering. Or it might also be actually a reason why someone was afraid, or many police officers, as their explanation goes, that I thought someone was about to shoot me. So it's better to shoot first and be fair and be safe, so to say. But now when it comes to these robots, which people are talking about, we we'll say the question is, can robots do better? Can a Robocop or a robot or a police officer do better? Where, for example, it doesn't have that need to save uh, its own skin. 
you know so it can always shoot second it can always wait first to be shoot uh, to be shooted first before uh, taking any actions out of fear so to say or any other prejudice that's what uh, other reasons why people are saying if we look at the plight of civilians or the innocent or those who actually are not legitimate targets maybe there could be a case of this kind of weapons the question is to what extent can uh, that or how far can that argument uh, t take us is it something acceptable or is it something so convincing that we should be able to accept this kind of weapons of course before i move to the next slide i should be able to mention that whenever people suggest this argument to say well, we need to introduce uh, this kind of weapons because, for example, robo cops or robo soldiers won't create some heinous crimes or war crimes such as rape. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why we should introduce them. I remember one commentator says, uh, saying that, oh, that depends. You know, there are many twisted people in this world. There could be actually someone who can program a robot, actually, which can be able to rap or do all those other crimes which you're talking about. It's an issue of an algorithm, but you know, I think that would be the, the in far extent. So I want to quickly move to the aspect where uh, robots have been already playing an important role or what, to what extent are robots also playing uh, a role in other fields, which, are, which doesn't have to do with uh, the decision of uh, life and death. Now, uh, I will start with the issue of machines or robots and the justice system, so to say. Already at the, uh, if, 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 if you know, at uh, the Stanford Law School, for example, I think I saw a project which is called Smart Prosecutions, uh, researches to what extent, uh, extent artificial intelligence, what extent can technology also contribute to the justice system. Uh, there is no doubt that really in the justice system, uh, robots can play a very important role. Artificial intelligence can actually play a very important role in uh, contributing positively to, to the justice system. Now, uh, I have an example. I actually know that there are some people who have been doing presentation uh, in the same kind of meetings, like the one which we're having today, to say that, you know, say, for example, issues of bail, you know, judges, human judges, so to say, I say it sometimes to make more mistakes than algorithms. For example, the, the, the slide which you are looking at right now, uh, a research taken uh, in, uh, in the US by the Department of Justice between 1990 and 2009 also revealed that, you know, 18.6% of the people who were released by human judges on bail reoffended. But when the algorithm, were, an algorithm was used, only 14.9% uh, Reoffended. So some people are trying to make a case that, uh, in terms of certain decisions, uh, probably machines can be able to do better. But now, again, a question comes to what extent, when we're talking about justice, because the understanding in many other, uh, uh, in, in the view of many, uh, of many people and many commentators, so to say, is that justice is a human to human uh, relationship. This is a human to human affair. To what extent do we want these important decisions? Because when I'm saying important decisions, for example, the right to liberty is a fundamental right from a human rights perspective. To what extent do we want to allow machines to make such important decisions as to deprive a person of, uh, of the right to life? I will ask a simple question probably to maybe members who are in this, a rhetorical question probably, who are attending this meeting to say, if we, believe so much in machines, would you, for example, prefer to have uh, a prosecutor cross-examine you uh, in, uh, in, in a court of law when you're accused of a crime, or would you prefer to have a uh, lie detector machine, so to say? Instead of employing a prosecutor, why not just you know, put a person on a lie detector machine and let them be asked questions and say what the machine is saying, that's the correct thing? Or alternatively, would you prefer to have a judge decide on whether you are going to have life imprisonment or would you like to have a human actually hear your case. So the arguments of people who say that there are certain things which machines can never be able to understand, especially when it comes to human to human affair. Uh, an algorithm only deals sometimes with the hard facts which are there, but sometimes the, there is more to that when it comes to the concept of justice. It's not a zero-sum game of numbers, but it's an issue of uh, human to human affair. Now, the same thing could be said actually in the field of uh, of, of, of uh, medical robots. 
they are suggesting to say, well, you know, if there are robots already playing a fundamental role in, uh, in, in, in the medical field, uh, saving lives, so to say, why can we not have the same, for example, in the military? But the argument goes to say that probably in the case of medical robots, their sole purpose or their main purpose of the objective where they are being developed is to save life, which is uh, the opposite of what lethal autonomous weapon systems are, because their prime intention or their prime purpose would be to take life. So in those circumstances, people still can argue even still in the medical field to say there are still others who might have reservations, who, who may prefer to have their uh, uh, surgery uh, done by a human being than robots, so to say. Right to life in the robotic warfare, I come again to the question, can AW uh, or autonomous open systems do better than humans? And from the photos which you are seeing, you can see that uh, others are saying, when it comes to humans, uh, because they might be driven by revenge or the desire to revenge, they may act in a certain way which are contrary to international humanitarian law principles. But robots, if trained or if programmed, so to say, in certain uh, circumstances where they're supposed to comply with, uh, strictly with the rules of international humanitarian law, then they can be able to do better, much better than humans. But I'll come back to that question, or on, uh, actually in my last slide, on, on the question whether robots will be able to do better than humans. Because in my research, I have argued to say that the question is not merely whether robots can be able to do better, because it goes beyond that. Even if they may do better, there may be ethical questions, especially when it comes to the right to dignity. Why maybe autonomous or little autonomous weapon systems should not be allowed or should not be deployed to say. But I want to discuss a little bit in detail, given uh, my time I'm trying to be as, as, as precise as possible, to look at some of the rules, especially in my research, where, which, where I particularly feel that maybe lethal autonomous weapon systems may not be able to comply uh, with the law, so to say. So in armed conflict, the question is, can they be able to comply with international humanitarian law rules, in particular distinction, proportionality, military necessity, and precaution? When it comes to the, 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 the rule of distinction, the rule of proportionality, these rules are part of custom and international law. It's generally now accepted, accepted that these are actually rules of custom and international law and important or being core actually in the national humanitarian law. There are very, very, very huge concerns that autonomous weapon systems, especially at present, may not be able to comply with these rules because, first of all, when it comes to definitions which exist in the national humanitarian law, uh, there are arguments to say that it may be impossible to be able to precisely program those definitions into a machine. For example, there are concepts under international humanitarian law which require human judgment, which only a human can be able to understand. For example, there is the concept of direct participation in hostilities, which is integral when you're talking of the principle of distinction. So there are those who have argued to say that if autonomous weapon system cannot be, especially in the current of conflicts which are having around the, uh, the world, in particular as asymmetric as, as, as warfare, where you find the role of civilians in those armed conflicts is not clear. It may be very difficult, if not next uh, to impossible, or if not even impossible, for, for a machine to be able to determine whether a person is directly participating in hostilities so as to make the judgment that a person is a legitimate target. Now, when it comes to the aspect of proportionality, many have argued to say that when you look at the, uh, the concept of proportionality under international humanitarian law, it requires human judgment. Why? Because proportionality is not an issue of uh, numbers, of which machines we know that they are good at the calculation from numbers, but uh, principle of proportionality, it's a human judgment. You know, what may be proportional at the beginning of warfare may not be proportional where the war is about to end. Will be machines be able to read such uh, such kind of, uh, of, of situation? The answer from many scholars is that probably not. In that regard, uh, there are reservations to deploy this or to develop this kind of weapons because they may be unable to comply with, uh, with, uh, with the principles such as uh, distinction. Now, this is not to dismiss that there are certain circumstances 
in which autonomous weapon systems may be able to comply with these principles. Examples which others give, say, for example, say it's in a desert in the Middle East. There, there are no civilians who are around, only uh, maybe uh, armed groups uh, or maybe uh, terrorists who are, you know, uh, moving around the desert. And the, specifically, there is a facial recognition pro uh, properly programmed into that machine. Can it not be able now, then now to comply with the law? Because if it's particularly looking for one Thompson uh, using facial recognition uh, technology, then it is likely that it may be able to comply with the law if it found the say Thompson, say, in a desert. Nevertheless, whilst those arguments make sense, still I have tried to argue to say that that's not the end of the game because uh, the legitimacy of one being a target, especially under international humanitarian law, can change in any second. For example, we have laws which relates to what's the combat. A person can become what's the combat or no longer participating in hostilities by virtue of surrendering, for example. So, or by virtue of being wounded and no longer being able to participate in hostilities. In those circumstances, the question is, if I were to be injured and in the desert and the machine has been precisely programmed to find me through facial recognition, it finds me I'm injured, will it be able to recognize that I'm injured to the extent that I'm mostly combat and therefore protected under international humanitarian law and an illegitimate target? Probably the machine may not be able to do that. Or for example, if I were to attempt to surrender, would the machine without the intervention of a human being be able to read that? The arguments also to that extent that probably not. The same arguments which I'm saying are also applicable in law enforcement situations where international human rights norms are pertinent. And this, because human rights norms under law enforcement, the standards are even more higher. The, the argument are even more skeptical, so to say, that autonomous open systems or robocops, as I would call them in my other article, may not actually be able to comply with law enforcement rules. For example, one of the principle, or one of the strongest principle under law enforcement is that it's only legitimate to, to, to kill uh, uh, another person if uh, the killing is meant to protect the life of another, what others have referred as to the protect life principle. Now, uh, that protect life principle, especially when you're looking at the, the necessity to kill another human being, it really requires at a very high, uh, higher level human judgment, human intuition to be able to read the intentions of, of, of the person or the suspect you are trying to arrest or to say. Will machines be able to do that? My uh, submissions in most of my research has been that it is highly unlikely in as much as this uh, technology might be prom promising to save lives. The case might not, uh, might not, uh, might not uh, turn out is actually what researchers are supposing. This is uh, not to say that, as I've already mentioned, that these kind of machines, they do have the advantages which they offer, which I've already mentioned to say that they do not suffer from fatigue, anger, desire for revenge, etc., etc. But as I've already mentioned, irrespective of that, still they may suffer from, 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 from uh, weaknesses which are inherent in the definitions existing in international humanitarian law or uh, human rights principles on the law enforcement. However, to me, especially uh, towards the, the, the end of 2016 when I was doing my research, one of the issues which made me come to the conclusion that probably lethal autonomous weapon systems should be banned before they come into existence was an issue to do with main, two main arguments, in particular what I call accountability challenges and human dignity. Under accountability challenges, the argument which, which I give is to say, the main issue with me is to say, the reason why autonomous open systems should not be allowed, for example, to come into uh, operation is that if they are autonomous, to say if there is no human intervention after they are activated, who is to be held accountable in cases where there are infractions of the law? In that regard, I always refer to examples of child soldiers. I've said that under international humanitarian law, child soldiers are not allowed to participate in hostilities. But the main reason may not be actually that child soldiers are not able to comply with the law, so to say. But it's because, first of all, in addition to them being children and being protected by conventions, like by the, uh, the Convention of, on the Rights of, of, of the Child, so to say, there is an argument to say that because they lack moral responsibility, legal responsibility may not attach to them. You cannot prosecute a child if it, uh, he or she ends up committing crimes. So 
Children, for example, I have argued that they can be trained perfectly to comply with the law, to comply with rules of international humanitarian law. But as you know, the law is messy. Something may happen, and uh, an infringement of the law may happen. Can you be able to prosecute a child? No. If you can't be able to prosecute... So, Thomas, Thomas, you have uh -huh. about three minutes left, so I was hoping that you could leave some time just for people to ask questions. But So we have, uh, we have to wrap up in a little bit. So. Uh, th 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 thank you very much for that. Let me actually actually uh, wrap, uh, wrap up with that statement to say that we, we, we faced with accountability challenges where I'm saying it's impossible to hold a machine accountable or to prosecute a robot. It's literally impossible. We may end up having an accountability gap. Because of that accountability gap, my argument is to say that there should always be meaningful human control on the use of autonomous open systems. In other words, a human being should continue participating in the making of the decision to kill so that if there are infractions of the law there is someone you can hope uh, hold accountable and lastly that is actually grounded on the human dignity which other uh, scholars such as Oren, Aaron Barak from Yale, Yale Law School had says that says that human dignity is the mother of all rights right if we forget about human dignity women as well collapse the whole international system of, of human rights so to say I agree to say that it would be may be undignified, it's an affront to dignity to allow a machine to make the decision uh, to take another uh, person's life. A human being must always be allowed to, to take that particular decision. With that, I'm sorry to have left a very few minutes uh, for questions. I can say that if there are any questions, probably all clarifications are uh, the more than welcome. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions for Thompson? How do we fit them all in? And yeah, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot to digest, uh, really. Uh, very interesting work. Uh, again, if anyone online has a question, please uh, unmute yourself. Um, but it's very interesting. I mean, those systems, in a sense, already existed in the form of, if you think about the former uh, Eastern Germany, they had these kind of automated kind of systems that would shoot anyone who was trying to leave. Eastern Germany, um, you know, it's as soon as you crossed a certain line, they would uh, automatically shoot people. And so, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, I, so it's always interesting, you know, what kind of, what kind of law you kind of, uh, if you even think about the legality, what kind of legal system uh, you think about being built into the, uh, you know, the, 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 the autonomous system, right? Like what kind of, you know, you, you, you measured it against, uh, what, what was the, the law that you uh, considered? And this is, is human rights law? Or, uh, uh, uh uh, in, in that regard, usually it also it depends on the context in which the autonomous open system will be used. If it's used in the context of armed conflict, then it's international maintenance law, which governs the law, uh, war, so to say. If it's uh, law enforcement, it's human rights system, including also law enforcement rules, uh, you know, regarding what should be done when actually someone is in law enforcement. Okay. And you are right to say that there are challenges uh, in that regard. Reason why the UN is currently uh, considering whether they should actually be a protocol to the UNCCW, in particular on autonomous open system, and what actually ought to happen. And that regulation either is going to propose a ban or to lay standards or to lay conditions which should be fulfilled before these kind of weapons actually are used. Okay. And so what's your, so, um, so you're, you're like, uh, what's your role in this conversation? So you're uh, uh, an expert for these uh, uh, organizations to come up with a recommendation of Yes. Uh, so what, what happens, I particularly want to speak for, for of IPRO, IPRO, the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Open System. Uh, this is an independent panel of scientists from across the globe. So I'm the only one representing uh, from Africa, uh, particularly also representing uh, on, on, on legal aspects. We are two of us who are, we have got legal expertise in that, in that group. So it's, it's, it's multidisciplinary. There are those who are in artificial intelligence, those who are philosophers, you know, so it's a multidisciplinary. And we're working in the framework of the United Nations uh, group of governmental experts. What we need to do is to come up with recommendations. Uh, so 
we were not taking a position. For example, my position, which, I'm, uh, which I've just explained today, are my own views. Uh, they are not really representative of the, the organization IPRO, so to say, or ICRAC, so to say. Uh, those are my contributions, so to say, to this, uh, to this, uh, to this whole program. So it's a scientific process, we, which in the end we are hoping, if we, if we are having the first meeting actually of the GGE in Geneva in, uh, in, in November, this coming November, we are hoping to submit our first uh, report to them on what we think should be the definitions uh, governing some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. It seems like Ruben has a question. Ruben, can you unmute yourself or, or maybe use the can chat you for your me? question? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. So just writing it up as we're, as we're talking here. Um, any um, emergent conversation um, like this where uh, there are sort of regional or sort of jurisdictional questions, but also sort of a, a broader narrative in the national community, um, there's a lot of noise, right? There's people who are um, saying things from a place of, of knowledge or, or others who are um, that are just piping in from the side lines from different perspectives. I, I wonder, as you um, sort of have a lot of focus into this area, which voices stand do you look to in terms of um, seeking consistency and a consistent um, reasonableness? And are those voices the voices of specific individuals or are they the voices of public organizations or national organizations? Um, what are the voices of private companies and their representatives? Uh, thank you very much, Ruben, for for that uh, for that uh, for that question. Uh, I would say, uh, if I understand your question uh, very well, there are many actually voices which are actually weighed in on the issue of autonomous weapon system. I will start with the scientists who are actually being uh, involved in the development who are more integral or robotics who are more integral in the development of this kind of weapons. There is actually a petition which has been signed by thousands of uh, organizations and companies uh, of, from, robot, from, from robotic, uh, ro robotics field who are actually against the development of this kind of weapons for ethical reasons and they've signed that petition to say we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, on the aspect of non-governmental organization, there are actually many non-governmental organizations, for example, the campaign to stop killer robots, uh, to which I'm party, uh, or to which ICRAC, the International Committee for Robots and Control, is also party. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's an organization or it's a campaign uh, composed of many non-governmental organizations such as Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International and others, more, more, more than 50 of them, who have come together to say we should have a preemptive ban of this kind of weapons before they come into existence. The, the individuals who have been so integral actually in the uh, regulation of weapons, the likes of George Williams, many of you may know George Williams, uh, the lady who was spearheaded the uh, outflowing of uh, personal landmines, you know, George Williams also, also and yeah, actual other influential women who won Nobel Prizes have actually also weighed on this particular issue, where they argue to say there should also be a preemptive ban. States uh, also have played a uh, part, they've also said their views, they've had so far uh, three expert meetings within the UN under disarmament committee, where states have expressed their views on these issues and we have states with uh, more than maybe 20 states we have expressly say we want these uh, weapons to be banned there are those who have actually said maybe more research needs to be done on this issue there are those who have not expressed views for example uh, states like the united states of america uh, who uh, one of the states involved in uh, or interested in development of such kind of weapons they've also stated their 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 views to say that maybe Clarifications, especially on definition, need, is needed before any taking of, uh, of of action. So, in short, many voices actually has been expressed there uh, on these issues from the African region. If you are talking of regions, uh, the African Union actually passed the declaration uh, on the right to life, uh, declaration number four, if I'm not mistaken. In particular, in paragraph 35, they specifically mentioned to say autonomous weapon systems or development autonomy is a very important in the in the in, in our current life today but autonomy should always be under meaningful human control. So there is a concept of uh, meaningful human control, which is emphasized, so to say. Okay, thank you so much, Thompson, actually. So I think uh, Ruben also would like to know, like, uh, maybe you could respond to him on the chat, like, uh, who, you, who he should follow on Twitter to learn, kind of learn more about those issues. But thank you so thank much you. again. Uh, round of applause. Thank you very much.
we Great. will be meeting again next week. Uh, yeah. do you know who's coming? Um, and Thompson, could you put your email in the chat as well in case people want to be in touch? Uh, okay. Uh, how do I do? The, let me just see. Okay. Um, get. Do you do you have a? Are you on Zoom? So, sorry. Come again. Are you on? You're on Zoom. There should be a chat window that you can put your email address in. I'm just wondering if other self defense rules that are. There's a chat on the bottom, but. Yeah. Oh, we go to self defense system itself, not self Yeah. At any rate. I was, um, I was seeing the chat earlier. Okay, yeah, here it is. Okay, okay. very good. Okay. Um, All right. Well, thank so, you. I'll, yeah, we'll we're meeting next week. week, and then um, we're not meeting on the 28th, uh, and then we're back on the 5th. We will be in a different room. Um, we will be in N102. All right. Okay, great. Do you know who's speaking next week, or we'll send out an announcement? Uh, announcement will be sent out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us this week. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So.